Hope, that's the word that people align with Star Wars maybe more than any other word. And uh, we're going to talk about maybe why Star Wars needs to give us more hopeful stories uh, in the world that we currently live in today. Uh, So we're going to have a pretty interesting discussion on that later. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us here today on the Resistance Broadcast. I'm John. Appreciate having you with us. The base is open. It's going to be a good time. We have a lot of cool stuff that we're going to talk to and talk about in addition to that discussion later. And with me, as always, Lacey and James. How's it going, guys? How we doing? Good. Going good. Still haven't gotten a crepe, so <laughs> not great. All right, let's let's okay. leave crepe. Let's leave crepe back on Monday. Let's. That was a that was a. Crepe I have to episode. finish the week strong. With the then same. have have a protein shake or something. I don't know. Right, Make okay. yourself a pancake. <laughs> what accent was that? It wasn't any. <laughs> have a waffle <laughs> or falafel. All right. Anyway, this is getting weird. Listen, hey, you brought up crepes again, okay? Yeah, it's you, all I want to eat now. You made us do what we did. <laughs> right. You created this. Yeah. It's like Palpatine. Look what I you have made. You know, my fingers start turning into crepes instead of long fingernails. Or, or Morgan Freeman. Should I wink there? <laughs> I created yeah. you. <laughs> right. Oh, Josh Robert Thompson. Legend. Um, all right. We have uh the discussion later, but James, we have uh an old favorite. Just kick off the show, get things going. Let's get into it. I fear nothing for all this as the force wills it. That's right, guys. Will of the Force is back this week. And as usual, if you are a commander, uh, oh no, sorry, I'm not a commander. Um, if you are a what, uh, major. major, that's right, in our Patreon, then you can start submitting topics to Will of the Force every week. And this week, we have a couple picked out from those people. Um, and we're going to kick it off right here with, uh, one of our commanders, actually, Stephen Bowman. Stephen asked us the question, will Oscar Isaac make his return to Star Wars in the upcoming Rogue Squadron movie? Lacey, you're going first on this one. Any chance that Oscar Isaac is going to find a way to make his way into Rogue Squadron? This is a great question. This is another, you guys come up with these great questions that like, I didn't even consider this. Mm-hmm. If, there's a big if in here, if Rogue Squadron takes place after The Rise of Skywalker, which supposedly it's a, it's going to take place after the sequel trilogy in the sequel trilogy era, then yes, he has to make some type of appearance at some point, so he will make his return for Rogue Squadron. Wow. Bold statement. John, are you sticking with that? Do you think he's coming? I am the type of person who likes to prepare my heart and my soul for hurt. So (laughs) in my brain, Rogue Squadron is not happening anymore. (laughs) So that when they announce that it's not happening, it doesn't hurt as bad. Um, I have no reason to believe it is happening. Uh, It was supposed to come out next December. It was called by Kathleen Kennedy that has been pushed aside, which is not a good term for the president of the studio to publicly say. So it's hard for me to think it's, it's hard enough to say Oscar Isaac's coming back to star Wars, but if we're putting him in a movie that's on the shelf right now, it's even harder for me to say yes. So I'm going to say no, I think he'll come back when they bring back Ray and everyone else. They'll kill him off. Do that whole thing. But he's not coming back for Rose Squadron. Hmm. So to keep it positive, they're not making this movie and they're going to kill him. But he'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I'm a little bit in between both of you because I'm going to say that, uh, you know, assuming the Rogue Squadron gets made, that's where we're at. Um, mm-hmm. I think regardless of the era, whenever it shows up, that Oscar Isaac is not going to be in it, though. Um, and I think it makes sense uh, if it is post- you know, episode nine, but at the same time, like I do think it would be kind of strange to have a movie come out and it's post episode nine. And like, why is only one of the characters? And it's probably like the one that maybe people even cared the least about. I don't know. It just seems kind of strange for him to be in that movie and not some of the other characters. And 
how you know why is he returning and stuff so i'm just gonna say if they're doing this movie they're just gonna make it like its own thing and none of those mm-hmm. people are involved necessarily uh, but let's move on to the next one here and i'm gonna ask this one's kind of a little bit different but on a scale of one to ten what will be your excitement level if they announce season two of the book of boba fett and we talked a little bit about this, this isn't on, a will of the force question what will be your <laughs> oh. excitement yeah boom uh all i right. knew he was gonna get that all right uh, John, right. since this is an awkward question, no, <laughs> no, we talked about about this on Monday, but let's put it on a scale of one to ten. What will be your excitement level? Uh, six, six. Okay, yeah. Um, any reason that that's not? I'm an not, like, I I touched on this Monday. I Book of Boba Fett is the only one I haven't went back to rewatch any episodes of yet um i really i enjoyed it i it it appears that i liked like the last episode most which was a lot of people's least favorite and i not really align with a lot of the quote-unquote fandom online but uh i just yeah if they do it cool um i'd l- i'd need to learn more about it but if they just said hey we're doing book of boba fett season two i'd i wouldn't be like i wouldn't be like all oh, right yes you know so six is kind of where I'm at. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lacey, your, what's your score? My score will be... <laughs> weird question. <laughs> uh, oh, if, my God. If Mando shows up, 10. If it's just Boba Fett, five. Hmm. Well, you're not getting details. They're just announcing Book of Boba Fett season two. You already gave your answer, John. Do you want well, you're to breaking the rules. Again? You're breaking the rules. I'm breaking the rules just like this question is breaking the rules. Good point. There's will in it. <laughs> touche, John. Or should I say, will touche. <laughs> what is happening right <laughs> now? You guys are both bananas. <laughs> I got it. I got it. You're excited about Mandalorian. You're not so excited about Book of Boba Fett, right? I'm excited about Mando showing up in the Book of Boba Fett. Thus, a 10. If there's a season two and he's in it, yeah. So you're giving but if your, he's not there. Your, and let's they, just <laughs> your post release of the season Answer reaction to. Yeah. Okay. All right. I <laughs> James James. If if Han Solo shows up in the Book of Boba Fett season two, ten. <laughs> yeah. I not agree. The question, it would be a but... ten. <laughs> anyway, uh... but your your question was excitement level. I said if he shows up. My excitement will be a 10. But you won't know when they announce it. You won't it. know. I hey, will Lacey. be excited when he walks out. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Just like I was excited. Hi, she did say will, did John. Hear? She did say They're will. They're making a season two of the Book of Boba Fett. That's all the info you get. What's your excitement level? One to 10. If Mando shows up, a 10. Oh, my God almighty. <laughs> um, go on, right a, on a scale of one to 10, for me, I went into this question... Uh, a f- I, I honestly it was like a four. I was like, I think you could allocate. But then your- you thought, but if Mando shows up. But then I started thinking about what if Mando came in. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, actually, let's just quit the podcast. Actually, after after we had talked uh, about what book of Boba Fett season two could be, now that he's sort of free of the the Jabba, you know that whole thing. Um. I'm a little bit more excited now. Uh, so I'm actually starting to look for, I'm, I, I might go with you on the six, John, but I'm kind of leaning on the seven thing. I said, hey, if if the writers and creators of the show learned something about season one and they were like, oh, I think people like the idea of Boba Fett, but they just didn't like the direction we went with it. Okay, let's let him be Boba Fett. Then I'm, I'm, I think that's the direction they would go. So if I saw Book of Bet's Boba Boba Fett season two announced. I have to imagine it's not going to be like season one. It would be a There's lot more be more Mando. It would be yeah. It would be a lot more like the Boba Fett that you would hope to have gotten. That's what I would think. So I think they would be taking a step in the right direction with the season two. So I would be more excited. I'm gonna I'm gonna say seven. I'm gonna say seven. Um, all right, we got another one here from one of our patrons. <laughs> this one is from Nick Kratz, who's actually one of our generals. So salute to What's you. Up, Nick? Hey, Nick. Uh, Nick sent us this question asking, will we see 
Plagueis in The Acolyte, and could we finally get more canon details on that character? Um, Lacey, you're going first on this one. What are your thoughts for Plagueis? Thanks for the question, Nick. I have to admit, though, every time there's some type of Plagueis or Palpatine question, it always ends up going me first. And oh, I'm always really? like, yeah, but not... Oh. Not like because you are purposely going to me. It just happens that way. Anytime there's a like, rebels question, it's like, I want to hear your answer first, James. <laughs> I want to hear John's first with yeah. Plagueis and Palpatine. And then it's always me first. Oh, gotcha. Um, will we see him? I, no. No, we won't. <laughs> um, But I think we could get canon details. So a no to the beginning of your question, but a yes to the end because... If it's going the direction that we believe it's going, which is talking about the dark side and like how the Sith are, you know, laying their plans for eventually taking over, I, you'd have to assume that he's going to come up eventually. So I would say yes, canon details, no to actually seeing mm. Plagueis. Mm-hmm. Okay, John, do you have the same thoughts? Um, I I have trouble understanding how much of Plagueis we actually know. Um, because like, is he a moon? Is that, is that canon? I believe it is. And like, what's their life expectancy? Because I'm seeing on Wikipedia that the acolyte takes place a hundred years before revenge, uh, the Phantom Menace. So is this like, are they an, like, are they a species that live a long time? Does anyone know that offhand? Yeah. Like I'm trying to look up moons, like of what life expectancy are. Oh. I mean, it says average lifespan over a hundred years. Well, let let uh, that's legends though. So, so I don't know. Like, but, but side note, how long does a normal human live for? How long does a Sith human like Palpatine live for? <laughs> well, he was only like in his 80s though, right, or something like that. Well, so. he's also in like 119 years old, <laughs> like chilling on Hex- Exegol. Oh, and his clone body. Now we're talking I about understand, clones, but, but I understand, but yeah. I think that I, I think that there's some aspects of the dark side that if they really wanted to stretch it out, he if he could create life, he could probably sort of extend his life as well if they wanted to play in that world. Well, I um so now we're really like stretching this out because you threw a lot at me here. That has nothing to do with the question. So we're having a wonderful will of the force today. Uh Embrace I don't, it. Yeah. Feel I it. think I think when Palpatine said that to Anakin, he like he didn't Plagueis didn't know how to create life. He was saying he was trying to figure out how to actually do it. Um so anyway, I think there has to be some involvement with him in here otherwise the acolyte really doesn't serve much of a purpose. Um the fact that they have it where it's situated um and they haven't made a series yet that doesn't have any connection to the original saga. Everything that's come so far has some sort of connection to it. This would be the first that didn't. I I think they will have something to do with Plagueis. I'm not positive whether he's going to be in it, but depending on how loosely you use the phrase, is he in it? I'm going to say yes. I think people have been dying for this uh, character to make an appearance he means a lot to the story because, again, it's one of those things where, like, how did he shape and influence Palpatine, the greatest villain? So when you have the greatest villain and you're you're about to tell us the person who helped shape him into what he is, I think that's very, very interesting. And they haven't, again, they haven't stretched out to the point where they've told stories in these live action series and animated that aren't connected to the original saga. So I think that continues. Um, they seem to be having trouble branching out with these bigger projects beyond things that tie to this. So I say, yes, I think he's going to be involved here. I am in agreement, John. I think he is going to be involved. And I did pull up, I mean, that we're, we might be looking at the same thing, but just an article that was like the oldest living Sith or whatever. And it says that, you know, he was, he lived for about 115 years, but the only reason he was killed is because his apprentice killed him in his sleep. So maybe he Hmm. could have been even older. It's like, you're also thinking too, like, when did that happen? That, that could have happened 30 years ago 
from the Phantom Menace, and he was 115 at that right. time. It's right. like he definitely right. could be around. That was Legends yeah. lore. If they just carry that over, um, they don't have to like change things. So I, I definitely think he could be around at this time. I think it ties in perfectly with Palpatine. I'm I'm almost in the boat of wondering how much Palpatine could be possible in this album or in this show because yeah I know it takes place at this time but the end of it could be like 50 years Very later. Very true. You know? They could go right up to it, yeah. And then it's like mm-hmm. it shows like after Plagueis just killed off everybody in that series in this red wedding style whatever, you know, who knows? Then they go 50 years later and they see this guy. Now he's even more worn out and crazy looking. And he like, he's in his bed taking a nap yeah, or, and all of a sudden a pillow goes over his face. I love that James just used the red wedding as a, as a <laughs> yeah. reference. Well, I think it's he's like, never watched Game of Thrones. Yeah. I just think it's like a, a cultural oh, no. thing, but, um, but no, <laughs> what I was picturing was like him, like crazy Plagueis looking character. And he's like reaching out and picking a baby up out of the crib and everybody, and then that's how it ends, you know, or something. Ooh, yeah. Baby it's sheep. Like, oh my God. You know, like, oh, he's been it, like, that's it. You know, it's just like, apparently he's been like aware of him since birth, you know, it's oh. like, uh, that'd be nuts. And then yeah. that line to Anakin makes even more sense. Yeah. Like that we're going to keep a you close pass on. on your, yeah, you pass on your abuses to yeah yeah and 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 what would be crazy about that too is like it would also help palpatine in the sense of like i don't ever want to see like a palpatine that was decent and then he turned bad it's like right i agree like if you pick that baby up and that baby never stood a chance it was always evil and it was always doomed right. kind of thing i don't know maybe right. that could be well palpatine cool. was like michael myers right in the in the non-canon novel like he killed his family and stuff oh i don't know wasn't that the story yeah Pro- probably doesn't sound doesn't yeah I, yeah i i agree i need i don't want to see palpatine like like a happy kid who got like converted I need, <laughs> like, like he, they're he doing with president snow in the hunger games yeah never saw that it's the new book that's out. They're like, they made a book out of that movie. Two parter to close out. Will the force this week? Will Cassian have a love interest in Andor, and will that person die in the series? Uh, John, you get to go first on this one. I should have just flipped these two, right? Um, do you what? What do you think? Any chance? Now is John going to give his honest answer, or is he going to give the answer that I sent hmm. to him earlier I today? I don't know. So sure. off the top of my head, I think he will. Um, and I think that person will perish because Tony Gilroy is all about that depressing Star Wars. And that's my simple answer. Hmm. All right. Well, Lacey, what do you think? So the funny thing is when we first heard, I'm blanking on her name again. Uh, the, Adria the- Arjona. Yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous, uh, two braided woman in Andor. Um, that she was going to be his love interest, and I'd said that. And then someone had tweeted online that they were brother and sister, and I was like, "Oh God, did I go too far with Star Wars?" <laughs> and then it ends Star- up Star Wars is that, okay with that. <laughs> yeah, and then it ends up Tony Gilroy just did an interview that he did say, in fact, they've been like dating each other involved with each other their whole lives and that they're you know they have a love interest or a history Mm. um Mm. so i was right i've been right before do you think when she inevitably dies oh and she's definitely dying that that was the other part her last words to cassian which will make the end of rogue one make more sense is never kiss another woman you can hug them tightly and tell them that their father will be proud of them, but don't ever kiss another. I was woman. gonna say, is she gonna do what you said, which yeah, is yeah, I thought that's you what you made your doing. father proud. No, yeah, probably something more like that. Your father would be proud. proud. All I know is that Tony Gilroy has hinted, which we already knew this was gonna happen because he's the one that wrote it, that this series is gonna make moments in Rogue One even more emotional. So, yes, I think he's gonna. We see a Cassian in Rogue One who has got nothing to lose. Who's killing people? Hmm. Has it all on the line, basically, to do this? Like, he's fully invested in what the rebellion is doing because he has nothing else to basically live for except the rebellion. Um, so I think that this is gonna, this person's gonna die, 
and in a way that's going to probably haunt him and to drive him forward to continue the mission of not letting her die in vain. Yeah, or like someone very prominent in the Empire. Maybe it's that new uh, female antagonist, the new Krennic, so to speak, mm -hmm, kills mm -hmm. her. And it just, it's a, it's another driving force in his hate for the Empire. Like, you know, like. Because when... we, as we know with Star Wars, it's like as soon as people don't have ties to anything else or nothing else to lose, that's when they then push themselves to that level of like the overall mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Tony Gilroy is not right in the story where she just leaves and goes off and runs a deli somewhere. Like they show her bleeding in the trailer. Do they? She has a huge gash on her head and she's bleeding. Yeah, and we'll like some someone's talking blood? to her down on mm -hmm. like a, she's like down kind of like kneeling. Hmm. Um, I, you know what? Like, sure. Like, that's the thing. It's like, I, I don't know what angle there would be to say no to this. I mean, that's a fine story. If, you know, he has this love interest and he gives himself or he gives a little bit of himself to her and then it all just gets taken away. And so he's like, well, then what's the point? It almost does make a little bit more sense is why, like, he wasn't, like, interested in Jin. you know? It was like, you are part of what we're doing here and there's no, like, uh, tension between us romantically or anything like that. It's always been, like... Uh, an admiration angle. I, n I never, I've, I've never really, like, I've, I think I've talked about it, like, it, it could be possible, you know, like, maybe in another life, those two would have clicked, but I, I never felt like Rogue One gave off the impression. I always thought that their relationship at the end of that movie was just like, here we are, <laughs> me and you, there was you a, know? There's the we moment in the elevator that, like, you think it's gonna happen and it doesn't. I, I, yeah, I, and I think that's at the beach, but the elevator. Go back and watch it. It's very I, tense. I think that I think the elevator. I think Lacey's right. I think it's the elevator scene. But to me, what, when I rewatch that in the con I'm not against elevator, all of it. I think that uh, to me, that elevator scene read like they 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 don't know, but they know. Like it's over. Like we did it. And they're like looking at each other like, are we really here? Is this really happening? We're going to, well, I don't know. I it's like they just know without knowing, you know? Yeah. And I think also if, you know, this character that we talked about on Monday, uh, Cyril Karn mm -hmm. has this obsessive uh, inf like fascination with Cassian. He's going to try to not only destroy Cassian, but destroy him in every way yeah, possible, yeah, yeah. emotionally and physically. So if he finds out that this woman is attached to him in any way or has any type of relation to him, whether it be family or romantically, especially if it's someone that he cares about, he's going to destroy her in a way that Cassian sees it. Uh, that's kind of would, like a common thing. Would you say the more he tightens his grip, Andor will slip through his fingers? Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, there was something in like that that twenty nine page whatever the hell that thing. Yeah, was they released that... like a twenty nine page document about Andor, but they definitely talk about the relationship between the two of them uh, and how it's like a they've tried dating on and off for a long time. So I see I see her dying at the hand of Cyril Karn to show how bad he is. So, <laughs> yeah. So this is what Gilroy says about her. Um, she and Cassian, her name is Bix Kayleen. Um, she and Cassian have been flirting and dating and circling each other and breaking up since he was 10 years old. Um, they know everything about each other. They're meant Childhood to be together. Yeah. They're meant to be together, and yet it's been impossible all these years. When we come in the show, the first episode, she's done with him. He's burned every last bridge, but they do have this business together in stolen material, and that will come to controversy in the first episode. So, oh. uh, sort of like jilted lovers having to come back over a, over a bad circumstance so maybe we're going to get that Han but and Leia. But the feelings like, are still there. Yeah, just like yeah. antagonistic against each other and that sort of thing. That type of Star Wars She's going to get romance. used against him, though. That is a bet. 
Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, all, uh, all good answers. Uh, I think it was all the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> all right we are getting ready to i did a little george lucas there <laughs> um john take us into so, the discussion because that is it for will like of it. the force all right our discussion this week the world needs hopeful star wars stories more than ever obi one once thought as you do so in 1977, Star Wars struck at the perfect time. A story of hope, triumph, friendship lifted the spirits of moviegoers dealing with a grim real world in the late 1970s America. Flash forward to today, in a very tense and tough time, people are struggling. A, people, a lot of people are depressed, pandemic, inflation, economy, wars, all this crazy stuff happening in the world. Fans need stories of hope. Stories that make them leave happy, perhaps more than ever. So let's mm -hmm. talk about Star Wars' role in lifting a society. And are movies still as influential and as impactful as they once were? Um, so there's a lot of angles to approach this from. I thought of it because of Dave Filoni's quote when he was talking about how Star Wars should make people feel happy and hopeful. And uh, that was like the main thing that the main prevailing thing George Lucas wanted people to leave with was that take all the themes, all the other uh, mythology and, and the fast cars in space and all that stuff. The bottom line is he wanted people to leave the theater feeling happy and hopeful. So, um, so it's funny cause we've been talking so much about Andor, which is obviously not going to be that story. So we have that coming and people are very excited mm -hmm. about that. But I was really thinking about this because all the stories I heard from my parents and the documentaries and you hear about how Star Wars really hit at the right time because a lot of movies back then, even especially sci-fi movies, were all like grim stories about a mm -hmm. horrible future and stuff. Mm -hmm. And George Lucas flips the coin and says, no, I'm going to give you something to be happy about. And I struck at the right time with audiences and, and people needed it. And I think uh, in addition to it, just like sort of setting the bar for how movies are made. And we talked about that all last week with Light and Magic. I think it was also just the perfect timing and that type of story people needed to see at that time in 1977. And I feel like we're back in that now. Like, you know, Top Gun Maverick. Like, Maverick, it, you know, it, it's still making so much money because it just made people feel good walking out of the theater, whether you were a big Top Gun fan or not. Look what that did. Uh, I think with modern Star Wars, I love the sequel trilogy, but it's like, I'm trying to think of all the things that came out. And it's like, yeah, Force Awakens ended with you know han solo dying and we see luke and he looks a little sad at the end and then we have the last jedi and that was a pretty grim movie and then you have the rise of skywalker it's like yeah they sort of come together at the end but at what cost leia dies ben solo dies and it's like you know there's a price there's always a price to pay rogue one they all die um the the only one that really didn't have that feeling was solo and i think a lot mm -hmm. of people like to rewatch solo because they feel good it makes right. them feel good han and chewie together they're going off on an adventure Da, 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 you know it's weird seeing some of these like star wars movies that have sort of a somber ending mm -hmm. and then you hear that triumphant credit music and you're like that doesn't seem right and i just feel like and i'm not sure what ahsoka is going to give us you know we've speculated is she going to live die but you can't say disney has been overly disney with star wars they've let lucasfilm do what they want to do and kathleen kennedy for all records in terms of like her her calls about rogue one that we talked about how she said they mm -hmm. all they all have to die they all need to die they are you got to give them credit that they're you know pushing the envelope in terms of the drama in star wars but the question i have is do we kind of need the next version of star wars stories to be where all the are all our heroes make it through and it's okay to tell that story sometimes. You know, you're not insulting your audience by giving the happy ending. And, it, you know, Lacey, you talked about that for a long time with Ben Solo. And I had my disagreements with you in terms of, like, how the character went and stuff. But I understand your your narrative. I always understood that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I'm coming from with this. Like, with the way the world is and, you know, I'm, I'm in a better place than I was a year ago. But I know a lot of people still are having a hard time. And everything that's going on just seems like one thing after another. Things are just a really, really rough time. And even my parents mm -hmm. say, like... It's probably just as bad, if not worse, than the late 70s, which was a really dark time for our country. So is this the time now where maybe if they're struggling with these ideas at Lucasfilm for future movies, start with 
simplicity, which is let's tell them a story of hope that ends with a happy ending. Hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I feel like I'm the biggest give me hopeful, happy ending person out there. I that has been my biggest critique of Disney Lucasfilm mm -hmm. is that with the exception of Solo, um, every movie is so depressing. It's just like... And the shows too. <laughs> the shows too. Yeah. I mean, Mando has been pretty good about giving you a good happy ending. I think John Favreau understands that. And that's stemming from his want to make something that families can watch together. Mm -hmm. And I think that also stems from things that Dave Filoni, like you said, had said about Mando, which was George had only always told him to make stories that are hopeful because kids need hopeful stories. Families right. need that. I don't think just kids need that anymore. I think everybody needs that. I agree. Everybody needs something to escape to. And I think that's what's driven me to Star Wars my entire life is that it was something that no matter what was going on in my life or in the world in general, you could escape to this place that the good guys win because the good guys don't always win in real life. Um, right. Oftentimes they don't, unfortunately. So it, and to say you... that we get that in current Star Wars, I would say is not the, the case. And that yeah. going off of what you had said, John, that was one of my biggest arguments for Ben Solo wasn't necessarily the Raylo angle per se. It was that it was Han and Leia's son. And if they had to die, at least let their son live and have the happy ending that they wanted for him. That's because fair. everybody fair, wants fair to argument. see that. So yeah. when he yeah. died and Michelle Regwan was like, it's hopeful that he dies. I was like, whoa, now. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing someone dying is hopeful i don't care who it is it is never hopeful to describe well, someone maybe dying but yeah well that's different though that's mm, destroying evil i'm saying yeah. like anybody that's on the kind of i don't know troubled path or any type of uh, it's trying to come back to the good side it's never hopeful that they die and they shouldn't have to die. And I yeah. think that that's something that was very interesting recently going a little off of Star Wars, but back to Jon Favreau, is he had a, a discussion with the Russo brothers about Tony Stark dying and was like, I don't oh, want right, him yeah. to die. Please don't yeah. kill him. And he like called the Russo brothers and was like, please don't kill him. It will be very like not hopeful, not happy. People will leave your movie and go walk into traffic is what he told the Russo brothers. Who was this? And uh, Jon Favreau. Favreau. Mm -hmm. And they said that they listened to him and they were like, oh, he was very upset. We had to talk him off a ledge. And they said that they got off the phone call and they were just like, yeah, we're still going to kill him. <laughs> like, I, I, I feel like oftentimes in, in, I would say the past decade, it just feels like everyone, all these writers are going for that darker, critical story, but not in a way that it makes sense in just in a way that they're like, well, I'm just going to kill this character and it's going to be more impactful. And my argument is that doesn't ser doesn't necessarily mean that that's true. Like you don't have to kill everybody to have a good ending to a story, to have a, a final wrap up of a character. Um, and I feel like oftentimes, especially with Star Wars, is that their response is, oh, this person has to die. That's how yeah. this person's going to end is they die. And it's like, I, okay, but do they have to die? I want to bring you in here james but lacy you just made me think of this and i don't want to lose this thought is that i and this is my perception of how mm -hmm. i feel like they approach these things now like the the modern view of storytelling they feel like it is cheesy and too predictable to just have the good guys beat the bad guys these days it's not you know the old cowboys versus indians or the cops and robbers and the good guys and the bad guys it's we need to mix it up a bit and do the gray area thing. And if there is going to be a victory, it has to come at a big cost because that's what audiences expect. Because it's with more realistic. Like maybe, yeah. maybe I don't yeah. want realistic. Maybe I do want Tom Cruise flying over a mountain at a billion miles an hour because it's just fun. Right. And I think, yes, Star Wars should be the exception sometimes to this whole new approach where there has to be a price to pay for victory and stuff. Like, and I know we had there, George Lucas had plenty of death and loss in Star Wars. I understand that. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he, Harrison Ford and, and Lawrence Kasdan wanted Han Solo to die. And George Lucas was like, absolutely not. So, 
maybe sometimes it's okay to to not feel like you're insulting your audience by giving them the fairy tale because that's what Star, Star Wars is. So James, what you know, what what are your initial thoughts on this? And I know, like especially you, I want to know because Rogue One's been your favorite of the modern mm-hmm. Star Wars stuff. Clearly, one of the darker stories. Uh, even though it ends ironically with the word hope from Leia, but Andor looks like, you know, being that it's leading right into to Rogue One, it's not going to be necessarily this happy sort of ending either. So where are you on this idea? And uh, I want to hear your, your initial thoughts. So, okay. So I I kind of feel like I'm on a little bit of a different page than you guys. Um, and I I hate to make it not Star Wars, but bear with me for a second because this this like changed my perception of what these words mean is I've been a Lincoln park fan for a very long time. And they put out this album a couple years ago and they put out that first single. Uh, it was called heavy. If anybody wants to check it out, but there was, it, it, they all of a sudden were back in the spotlight. All of a sudden they were like, people were paying attention to the game because this song was like people were hearing it and they were going that's lincoln park and it's like well it's been 20 years since you remember the last band but there was uh and you guys have seen it there's a um a channel that does like reactions like teens react right you've probably seen something like that teens react to this artist or something right yeah sure they worked with them and they did a teens react to the the new Linkin Park song and they gave their opinions about it and then like a week later they had Mike Shinoda like the singer and the the like kind of author Taylor of this music he responded to their reactions like so he got to watch them say what they thought about the song and react and he got to say what he was and the biggest thing that I took out of that and I will all I I it stuck with me so strong is that everybody that was that was talking about his song was saying that it was negative and it was sad. And he said, he, it, like it hurt him internally. He's like, it's not sad. It's uplifting. It's hopeful. And I'm like, I, I've been a Linkin Park fan for the longest time. And he said that. And I knew why I was like, Oh my gosh. Yes. He just, verbalized my feelings and I didn't know that but he was like explaining why I like that music and I'm like I think everybody's looking at this like it's sad and it's uh depressing and it's like it's not that are you listening to the music it's uplifting and it's hopeful I think that's different though because with any art whether it be music or movies or books anything Mm -hmm. it's all about personal perspective so he might think it's uplifting because he wrote the song and he but that doesn't then downplay the other people that experienced it and said that it was sad. I, I kind of you know disagree I mean? like with it that, actually. It doesn't make it wrong I see, because I, it's whoever takes it in is their own personal perspective. And that's why people like books and movies and music. I get because that. Because it's but, about a personal But you can journey. still write a song that's like a sad song. And if somebody describes it as happy, it's like, no, this is a sad song. Well, like, I, I don't know. I don't know the song, but if kids are yeah. reacting to it, they're probably going to listen to the sound of it. And if it sounds sad musically or somber, it sounds they're gonna- uplifting. That's that's the thing that's missing. It's not even the words. I think they're listening to the words and not listening to the music because the music is well, what's well, uplifting. All right, so so apply it to Star Wars. The, so, the thing so, to yeah. me is I think people look at these stories at like Rogue One, for instance, and everybody says, like you guys included, it's sad, it's depressing, why did they have to die? And I'm like, I don't think that's what's happening. It's uplifting, it's hopeful. Uh, to me, that's... That's why it resonates when she says, like, after all of that, what do we have now? Now that all of the events have happened, we have hope. And that's exactly what that story is about. I walk out of that feeling positive, feeling good. It's not about their death. And we talked about that at the end of some of these shows, too. I think we recently were talking about Mandalorian season two. And every and I think you guys and, you know, the kind of the cultural a feeling about it was that it was a sad ending and i'm like sad i don't get that i get uplifting i get hopeful like that to me is like it's it's it puts you in this place where it, it's 
like if those characters died, that would be sad, right? But it wasn't sad. It was hopeful that we're moving on. This is the end of a chapter. It's bittersweet, but it's sweet nonetheless. It's there's something good about this. And I feel like Star Wars has been doing that for a very long time. And we even mentioned Last Jedi. And I'm like, gosh, is that not the biggest hopeful movie? Like, why are people looking at that like it's a sad movie? I'm like, the kid at the end, like raising up his his lightsaber, like, it, you know, he, there's hope in the galaxy. It, it exists. I feel like Disney Star Wars has been doing hopeful very well. And I think people are misappropriating it to sad or depressing. And I'm like, I don't think that's it. I, I think we're maybe confusing sad and depressing with hopeful. I completely 100% disagree with you. And I don't think I'm misrepresenting it or not seeing it the way that yeah, I should I be seeing I it. I think, I think I understand Star Wars pretty well. I think that there are moments and glimmers of hope and happiness in these stories. But overall, I wouldn't ever say that everything gives me the feeling that I got from watching either A New Hope or Return of the Jedi, which I think are the two happiest of the Star Wars movies. But not hopeful. Return of the Jedi. Happy, but not hopeful. Like, Solo to me is happy, not hopeful. I, I don't get hopeful from Rise of Skywalker. I don't get hopeful from The Last Jedi. I don't get it from I Rise of Skywalker either. Sad. I get happy from Rise of Skywalker because yeah, they vanquish the evil. It. It's done. I, I, I Hopeful don't... is the movie where the bad things are happening, and yet there's still hope that we can win this. We can pull it out. That's I understand where you're coming from and why you think that. I'm telling you my personal perspective is that I don't see it as hopeful. Yeah, I we, see it as very depressing. Which is fine. I mean, we're here to talk about, sure. you know, the world and, and is Star Wars dope. Are Star Wars stories, have they been hopeful? Do we see them as hopeful? Do they need to be more hopeful? Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I think that culturally, I hear a lot of things like, oh, Rebels, it was so good, but it's so sad that, you know, it ends up the way that it is. And I'm like, I, again, I'm like, that's Dave Filoni. That's knowing what Star Wars is. That all that whole story to me is hopeful by the end of it. I, there's, there's hope that Ezra is still out there. There's hope that what we've done today can lead to think, the win, to the fight yeah, at the end I, of the day. I think, I think you might be hanging on to the word hope too much because we titled the discussion that. But but I that's think, how you started too, as you said. I think sure, but Star but, Wars is hanging on that word a lot. Right, right. But Filoni, like, it's based on his quote saying people should leave the feel theater feeling happy and feeling good, and. I don't feel that way when I watch Rogue One. I just watched the entire cast, all these characters who I fell for throughout this whole journey, die. I just watched all these rebel soldiers get massacred in a hallway. Uh, but, but at the end, because Leia gets handed the plans that I knew was coming anyway, and she says, hope, I, I feel happy leaving. I don't. Um, I understand it. Uh, I'm not lost on it at all. But I don't... I don't leave Rogue One or The Last Jedi when Ray's sitting there holding a broken lightsaber, Luke's dead, <laughs> and Han's I sat still in dead. silence for 45 minutes after The Last Jedi the first time I saw it. I, I don't I, I don't feel yeah. the way I feel on Endor at the end of Return of the Jedi. Like, it's different. It's a different feeling. I understand that the kid with the broom is saying, like, there's still inspiration out there in the galaxy, and Luke Skywalker, mm -hmm. like, lit the... I get all that. It's the feeling of the movie overall and how it sits with you, I think, is what I'm I'm coming from here. Not like what this is handing off to. It's the 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 overall feeling of the movie. Like you stack up a new hope and play that movie in your mind and put that against like Rogue One or Last Jedi or even some parts of like Force Awakens and Rise of Skywalker. Uh or or Rebels. I'll go there too. You know, that but it's 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 a different sort of feeling and i think they are trying to appreciate the complexities they know that the original star wars audience are older now and more mature so they're trying to tap into them while also pulling in the youth i get all that stuff um but i think for the sake of escapism and what movies are 
you go into the theater and the real world, you, you don't have your bills anymore. You don't have your relationship problems. All that stuff's gone. As soon as you walk in with your popcorn and that door shuts, you are now in a galaxy far, far away. I think people need a pure, true story that is light and happy and doesn't have a cost. Like, it's not like, we'll give, we'll give you this, but it's going to come at this cost. Like, I don't know. I, I want to see the next version where Han Solo's not stabbed through the chest by his son. I want to see something a little different. And I love that movie. And I love everything about it. That's not saying I don't. I want to see the mo- if they can do a modern version of the space western that George Lucas started this whole thing off with. And without feeling like they're insulting their audience's intelligence. I think as an overall thing, it's we're obviously we're focusing on Star Wars because this is a Star Wars podcast. Mm-hmm. But like I said earlier, I think it's an overall movie thing that people just think that audiences want that realistic take on certain things and yeah, they need the I'm, parallels with i'm this, in the yeah. side of and this might not be the case with a lot of people and i totally get that i'm on the side of i want to leave a movie feeling good <laughs> like i want to yeah. be like yeah that was awesome that was well, great it did yeah. have moments of crazy uh, complex relationships or conflict or tough moments mm-hmm. but when i left I knew that everything was resolved and everything ended up the way it should. I feel good. And I feel like like Star Wars doesn't always do that in recent movies. It's kind of like, I agree. It's kind of like, um, like George Lucas telling his fantasy stories, uh, which are very simplistic in nature. And yes, I understand there's, uh, you know, deep themes and you can look for metaphors and things that, that you want to see. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that's how you interpret art. And I understand that. But it was a very simple story. He, he wanted fast cars in space, but he also wanted good versus evil and something for a fable for kids to uh, a moral tale where they can learn the right choices to make. And it's like Star Wars and Indiana Jones were on the same highway together, going the same speed. And Indiana Jones kept on that path and kept telling those types of stories. And Star Wars was like, we're going to, we're, we're just going to make it more complex, more nuanced. And we're going to gray the areas between light and dark. And we're going to, we're going to go there. And Lucas did it himself too. But Indiana Jones kept saying like, Indiana Jones is never going to die. And you know what? He's not even going to lose his hat. Oh my God, and you're going to have a great time the watching this one. guy. There's no chance. No chance Indiana Jones is dying in the Indiana Jones 5. <laughs> Hell no. They've, they've killed off every other childhood character. He's he's on the chopping block, guys. <laughs> no. <laughs> Prepare Horse, yourselves. Sunset, Indiana Jones. Yeah, that could, has to happen. That makes more but sense. But do you, do you see what I'm saying in, in the sense where like... So, well, I, I mean, ahead. look, I, I get what you're saying. I think maybe it, it's me hanging up, like you said, on that word hopeful. Like, to me... I think I agree with what you guys are saying as long as my understanding of it is the title of our episode being the world needs happy Star Wars movies more than ever. And so sure. when when you guys are describing what you want out of these Star Wars movies, do we need more movies that more Star Wars movies that are happy? Then I go, OK, we can have that conversation. More solos, you know, more Rise of Skywalkers, right? And I would say uplifting because <laughs> see that that's that's where I'm I'm on the other end of that. See, to me, I think there's kind of these two types of Star Wars movies being like Rogue One and Rebels are hopeful. They're the uplifting story that leads would, to the happy story, which is a new hope because a new hope is happy. I'm Empire curious Strikes Back, if you were not depressing. Sure. Uplifting. I'm, hopeful. I'm, I'm curious if you ask Star Wars fans to describe those movies with one word, what word would they use? No, I, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree that that's the people, that's the word Gritty. that people would use. But I I tend to hear people <laughs> say that, and I would say, I, I I don't think you're using the right word. That That's what I think. Like when people say, oh, it's not hopeful. I'm like, I think it's hopeful by definition. But I think what you mean to say is it's not happy. I think because I titled this episode in this discussion with the word hopeful in it, you're stuck on that and you can't get rid of it. <laughs> well, because you guys are describing, we want more happy but, Star Wars movies. We want so, movies well, that make so, us feel good. So, and I'm so like, for, for, well, hopeful for the sake movies of, make you feel good. For the sake Depressing of the pitch, movies do not. 
For the sake of the pitch, I said, Star Wars, when it came out, was a story of hope, triumph, friendship that lifted the spirits of moviegoers dealing with a grim real world. Right? So I, I'm, I'm sort of saying, I want that. I want that from act one to act three. Mm-hmm. I want there to be danger, but I want my heroes to get out of it. I don't want there to be a price to pay. I don't want... I, I, like, if they told A New Hope today, like, uh, Han would have died. to die or something, and, yeah, or Chewie Leia would, would have to die in order for them to blow up the Death Star. Whereas... Or Obi-Wan would have to die in order for them to blow up the Death Star? Yeah, I know what you're trying to do. But no, I'm just saying that I'm already saying. is the story. Yeah. yeah. But instead, we got uh, the attack on the Death Star, like none of our main characters died. We got some fringe pilots who died, and, and, and that's, that's how it went. It was like, it was quite, quite on the nose of how that people may say were a little too hokey and cheesy, but that was the story he was telling was like, yeah, your good guy is coming out of this. And when he takes off his helmet, his hair might look good. You know, it's just like, it doesn't always have to be so modern. And I feel like Star Wars is like, we need to modernize our, our storytelling to, to keep up with how this is, this franchise is telling it. Like, it's, it's like Game of Thrones sometimes. I feel like with Star Wars, they're like, we need to have our red wedding. You know, we need to do, you know, do this, do that. Um, I'm not saying you're wrong, James, in terms of like, yeah, the end of the movies, of course, you know, they, they, they want us to feel like the next thing that happens is going you know, to be good. And Rogue One had to do that because, yes, there was a new hope after that. But, you know, we're going to get the Acolyte, which is going to be about the Sith. I don't know that mm-hmm. that's going to be a very, you know, uplifting, feel-good, hopeful Star Wars story. We're not sure what they're going to tell us with, the, with, with Ahsoka. That'll be interesting because Dave Filoni is doing it. So will he hold himself to that standard? We'll find out. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what, you know, what else, what other stories they have coming up, um, off the top of my head, you know, what, what's Taika's movie is going to be? We, we have no really idea yet. So I'm just saying the way the world is today, um, a lot of people, some, there may be some people listening to this right now saying like, I think everything's great and that's fine. But if you, if you just stick your head out the window and, and turn on the news and just, understand that a lot of people are going through things whether it's personal stuff whether it's how they're they just feel about the climate of our planet or international warfare uh you know pandemic still going on new things popping up new strains it's just it feels like never ending bills real life people want to go on a fun adventure without having a price to pay when they watch it and i i just think that's sort of the difference um so like those movies can end with a hopeful note but it's like what did i have to endure to get to that one word Mm -hmm. at the end of that movie and it's just like complete brutality and loss and devastation one other you know one other thing too about like andor specifically is i think Lacey, you have said multiple times that gosh that show's gonna be so depressing and then i think john you're like in agreement with that too and i'm like I don't know that it is. That's I didn't say not, depressing. I think it is because they have to lose a lot to get to Rogue One. Like, they have to lose. I don't think so. I think they totally do have to lose. And I think everybody you see on the screen is going to die because you don't see them in Rogue One. I think I'm, I've built up myself to the point with Star Wars that any character that you see in like, they're probably going to die. And that's because every single movie and show that's come out, they kill them. Mm-hmm. I made the yeah. joke at our live show that Dave Filoni likes to kill people. He does. They <laughs> like to murder people in their properties because they it adds more weight to the story. And I get that. I'm questioning, do they always have to kill these people? Do they always have to have these beats and these stories that leave you being like, oh, why did that have to happen? Yeah. I don't think Rogue One is or Rogue One. I don't think uh, Andor is going to be depressing. I think it's going to be serious. I, I think there'll be some humor in there because Star Wars needs to have it. It's going to. I go mm. back to it's a personal thing. I don't mean to cut you off, John. I I strongly go back to it's a personal thing. I'm going to find things that are depressing that neither of you guys are going to find depressing. I'm mm-hmm. going to sure. find things that are sad that you guys won't think are sad. But I, it, that's I also... part of taking in media. Yeah. 
But I also think Andor needs to be this way. Like it would be, mm. it would be weird if it, well, it, if it was like a Return of the Jedi or an, or right. Solo or something. It needs to be. This is the. This is why they have Tony Gilroy. That 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 story needs to be that. I'm not saying Andor needs to be this. I'm saying beyond Andor, as we look in the future, maybe Tyke is the guy who's going to do that. I don't yeah. know. I'm saying, do we need the light, fun adventure? Like, don't worry. This is going to be cool. Star Wars story. Well, um, yeah, let me without let me, it, without feeling like you're insulting the modern way of telling stories, where you gotta give something to take. Sure. Let me um just to to finish out that thought on Andor because I know you're right. I want to get to what you just said. Like my thought on why I don't think it's going to be. I mean, again, Lacey, that's like one of those things. Like if you've if if I see something and I'm like, oh, that's a that's a cool, uplifting, positive story, right? And you're like, no, that's depressing. That's just me being like. I, I want to give that to you. Like, why are you so sad? That's not the, that's not the story. Like, stop saying it's sad. And it, that like that internal thing of like, I'm getting something out of this and I don't know why you're not getting it. I want to give you that. Like when somebody really likes a movie and everybody else is like, eh, you're like, why, why don't you like it? You know? Um, but the Andor thing to me, I just, I see it very similar to rebels, like a comparison of like, I feel like the rebels. Yeah. They had their downs, but like, they won. They won often. And that's the only reason they're still alive is because every time they went in, they came out. And that, like, we know Andor lives. We know that Andor gets elevated within the Rebel Alliance because he's good at what he does. They send him on missions. He accomplishes the missions. So, yeah. it, to me, it feels like there's a pretty good chance that, like, this show still could have the, like, all right, this is Andor when he's young. What, what's the mission? We got to go blow up that tower, you know, and, and, you know, maybe people die along the way or people, bad things happen. But at the end of the day, boom, when that tower blows up, there's hope. We, we won the day. We didn't Here's win the, thing, the war, though. but there, now there's hope and people start to believe in us again because we took down the tower. We sure. saved this one small pocket of the galaxy and that's hope, but you know, the reason why I don't put Andor in this category and I still, and again, because I, 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 for some reason today, you need to explain to people the nuance of arguments. I'm not saying you guys, but it's just like, I am so excited for Andor. I think it's going to be awesome. Tony Gilroy, fan club president right here, accepting members. I don't think that's the story that people are going to be looking for, for that feel good escape feel positive walking out type of story especially especially because he said it's going to reflect the world we live in now right and we know the end game for cassian he gets nuked on a beach at at 30 years old or however old he is mm -hmm. it's just it, like we're watching this guy and knowing in five years he's going to be nuked dead you know what i'm saying like our main characters in rogue one all die horrible deaths and <laughs> The point is, like, the end, the last sliver of that movie, hope. Sure. Watching that whole movie happen, tragedy. Complete and utter death the and K2 tragedy. The K2 scene? Yeah. That's not hopeful. So, that's sad. That's the difference for me. I want these stories. I love them. I'm saying, let's go over here, maybe, and tell us a more lighter adventure story. I'm not saying it has to be Solo 2. I want that. Mm -hmm. But maybe maybe Taika takes us on a, a space adventure or something where it's not like, here are your main characters, six out of the seven of them are going to die, but the last one is going to look at the sun and say, we have a shot. You know, I, I, that's all I'm saying. Like, and, and it really is reflected on the state of the world. And James, maybe you looked, you walked through the world and you've said this many times. You're like, I don't see any difference. Like during the pandemic, you're like, I don't see any difference that, in my life. Well, no, no I, I just think that the movie that you described to me, and this is a definition thing, I just think what you just described is a hopeful movie. So if you want more hopeful movies, then that's the movie you're asking for. But I don't think it's what I, you're asking I know, for. And you're asking for happy movies that are like, good guy beats the villain everybody lives we all go party and or like that's a happy movie not a hopeful movie yeah you, you're doing the semantic thing dude i mean i'm pretty I, i'm just saying uh, i'm pretty like i'm doing my best to try to iron out the the, the layers here yeah yeah to the onion you know i think the difference james is that i don't find it hopeful when a team goes in and yes they accomplish the goal but they all die 
because to me that says that the next team they're all going to die and that's not hopeful yeah it's tough and and i appreciate that you can view the entirety of that movie or something as hopeful um i would like more freeze frame high five endings in star wars yeah and i I feel like that to me is hopeful i feel like we spend way too much time in this discussion talking (laughs) about rogue one and andor sure sure the point of the discussion was other more movies like solo in the sense that like there is it doesn't have to be this crazy thing even though the in in some ways that movie is kind of depressing too because han and kira don't end up together and other things like that but i don't think that's the the tone that they're trying to give a, th- that movie is supposed to be a fun roller coaster adventure movie that I think that's in Han some ways yeah. it's weird like that was like a, a thing that people didn't like about it oddly enough like when people say it's fine it's a fun movie but it's you know that was kind of a, a, a negative review of that movie in some cases but I think I do think that's that's something that Star Wars could use. We do need more of those stories that are just like and maybe Skeleton Crew's that story. Like, that's why I just I get crazy when I I talk about that whole like you want the Obi Wan sulking in the desert story. You don't want Han blasters having fun uh, running out the back door with his buddy Chewie. Like that seems more happy, adventurous. Uh, that's the Indiana Jones style. Like oh, gotta grab my hat, get out of this place. You know well, that's, before the that's, door that's shuts. The thing. We've yeah. been getting a lot more of the uh, former. We're beginning a lot more of the sulking yeah. version of Obi Wan, and yes, at the end, is he back? Absolutely. But it was a hell of a ride watching that guy be miserable for for a good portion of that show, even though we knew his end result. Again, maybe the cure to this is like, and this obviously goes maybe against the the idea of like more solo. Though I think a solo show would pretty much be sort of like a fun western caper type thing. Um, because we know Han and Chewie obviously would survive, but maybe it's the situation where we need something that isn't tied to something that we know what the end game is, you know? Um, maybe it is like, maybe these types of stories that, that require a return to that feeling of sitting in the theater and, and watching the heroes beat the bad guys. And sometimes it's okay to be that simple is something that has to take place after episode nine. That even has nothing to do with those heroes from episode nine. Maybe it has to be a blank canvas type of thing where we meet all these new characters and, and go for a ride. I'm not sure. And, and again, like I have to be clear because I feel like people are going to tear me apart about this. This is not a commentary against any of the star Wars stuff that we're getting. Cause I think it's amazing that Kathleen Kennedy is pushing those buttons and, and, and giving us uh, some mature elements to the storytelling. Because I hear all the time, Disney ruined Star Wars because Disney's Disney and they Disneyfied it. It's like they did the exact opposite, in my opinion. Like they, they took they, they made they took some of the fairy tale elements out of it, which has been fine. Um, yeah. Happily so know, Ever maybe, After is not how people describe a lot of the Disney Star Wars movies. No, exactly. Exactly. Yet that's how they describe Disneyfying something. They say, that, right, oh, they exactly. just make it happily right. ever after. Right. So I think my prevailing, like coming out of this, and you know, there's going to be more to this as we get more projects that come out. And it is certainly something we could revisit in the future. Um, but I think my conclusion for myself anyway, and then I want to hear your guys' final thoughts because I know we're up on time. Um, but I think in order to do this, we have to get away from characters where we know like their end games or we know like stuff like that. We need, we need to meet new characters with uh, no preconceived notions and learn to grow our relationship with those characters and, and that sort of thing and get those stories and still tell the other, uh, you know, nuanced, you know, heavy political dark stories. But like you said, Lacey and Tony Gilroy saying like, this is going to mirror our real world. I'm like, man, that's, it might be tough to watch at times. You know what I'm saying? And I, I think I need the opposite. I need the escape from our reality. So go ahead with your guys, you know, final thoughts, and then we can uh, hop on to uh, our last segment. Go ahead, James. Um, Yeah. I mean, if, if anybody is like totally on John and Lacey's side on this, I'm sorry that I, you know, get hung up on the specific word or anything like that. I just, 
I want to be clear that when, you know, when I'm seeing this, like, do, does the world need hopeful Star Wars movies? You know, I, I don't know. I just, I, I think the argument being happy Star Wars movies, do we need more of it in today in today's time? I'm like, sure. Yeah, that sounds good. I wouldn't mind. I feel like we've been getting a lot of these hopeful movies. That's just a definition thing. But I feel like if the discussion is about do we need more happy Star Wars movies, something that's going to have a little bit of escapism to it, something that's like, hey, Star Wars doesn't always have to be dreary, you know? Um, I wouldn't use the term depressing necessarily, although when I think about the prequels, I'm like, I don't think any of those were hopeful or happy. <laughs> um, but uh, but I think uh, we that Star Wars absolutely could use more movies where or stories even that we kind of get away from the dire circumstances of how bad it is to live under the empire and just sometimes how good it is to steal something and get away with it or whatever you know whatever that whatever these stories are that we want to tell where it it doesn't even have to be a force user it could just be the baron of some land that's you know uh taxing everybody and then they just like beat him down and take the town over and make it a free place again for all the citizens it's like that story can happen over there you know and it doesn't necessarily have to do with the empire but it can still be set in the star wars universe and w uh could star wars use more of that right now sure mm -hmm. it's just gonna expand mm -hmm. i think we're already leaning too heavily on some of the current galactic empire rebellion stuff and that was what was kind of enticing at the time of ryan saying i'm doing something over there you know something mm. you've never even seen before you know and i think taika is, is also though? well no i'm saying that's what he was <laughs> saying at the time i'm just you know joking. i'm doing this trilogy and it's gonna have nothing to do with anything we've seen before and it's like we were all intrigued by that idea oh what does that mean is it like are they even gonna say the word force yeah. you know um but taika right now is the person that seems to be leading a movie of that caliber and sure like, absolutely, like, do that, you know? That's fine. That movie can exist. Marvel has shown Taika's us. Taika's movie is like the Night of a Thousand Tears. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But <laughs> so Mar Marvel has shown us that you can still have connectivity and have, like, Ant-Man be a totally different tone than, like, the, you know, this sure. other movie. And yeah. so it's like, it's fine. Make some Star Wars movies that break away from what Star Wars has been in the Disney era. And cool. Yeah, that's that's good. I think I think I am for that a hundred percent. Right on. Uh Lacey, final thoughts before we move on? Um yeah, I, I think I think my my biggest critique with Star Wars, like I said earlier, is just that there aren't enough happy endings with Star Wars. Not enough romance, not enough happy endings, not enough of the stuff that we fell in love with with the original trilogy, which was we left the movie feeling happy and hopeful mm -hmm. that things would work out, that things would end good for the good guys, and there wouldn't be all the sacrifice and people dying and, oh, not everyone's going to make it out. Like, Star Wars was a group of people went into some went into a mission and then left and we're like we made it happen high five we're gonna party <laughs> and you left going see the good guys win the good guys get it done and everybody survives and they get to go live their lives now and i think that was my biggest critique going into the sequel trilogy is that where you pick up everything is terrible again and you're like wait a second when i left these people 30 years ago they were perfectly fine what happened um so i i think that's my biggest critique is like even if the story starts off in a way that you're like wow everything is against these people the hope is that at the end everything's worked out and i think oftentimes and i've said it before and i'll say it again a lot of modern storytelling is yeah things will work out but like everybody but one person's gonna die or like, oh, everything's going to end terribly and this whole city is destroyed and this planet's gone. But like, hey, they got those plans right. And you're like, but what about all this stuff over here? And they're like, eh, 
sacrifice. And you're like, but why can't it just not be a sacrifice? Mm. Why can't we just have a happy story with which at the end you're just like, okay, well, man, that is great. Now I have to go back to whatever crappy thing I'm dealing with in real life. But at least they made it work out and everyone's happy and having a good time. And I feel like oftentimes with Star Wars nowadays, I'm not having that feeling. Maybe on some episodes of Mando or some episodes of Book of Boba Fett. Maybe Ahsoka will be different. And I'm sure. sure there will be episodes of Andor where I'm like, yes, they did it. High five. But I think overall, it's going to probably be like a depressing, like, oh, look at the the kill count by the end of the series and like, look where everybody's ended up. But that being said, I'm super excited for the series and I know what I'm getting into going into it. I know it's not going to be, a, you know. Yub Nub and Ewoks dancing. I know. I know that's not what it's going to be. I, I love that Yub Nub has just become like the Star because Wars equivalent the of everybody being like, "We're Yub Nubbing all over the place yeah. here." <laughs> you know, I'm going to the I extreme mean, of like, you know, or like Luke, Leia, and Han and Chewie all hugging at the end of A New Hope. Like, I want more moments like that. And to me, that's hopeful. Not in the sense of what you're saying, James, where you're mm-hmm. like, it is hopeful because. They got the plans or they, you know, there's more good in the universe. I'm saying it's hopeful because it reminds me that, yes, life sucks sometimes, but in this fantasy world, things are great. Right. And I feel like oftentimes in current Star Wars, that is not the case. I leave the episode or I leave the movie going, wow, they, I guess, accomplished the mission. But at the end, everyone's unhappy, Ray's alone on a planet. And Ben Solo died. Seems like what was the journey worth? You know, <laughs> like hmm. that's how I feel. Yeah, yeah. And I know, like the Duffer Brothers got a lot of criticism after season three of Stranger Things because they're like, you didn't kill any of the main characters. And it's like, but maybe the thing is, kids, is like, why they don't? Why do maybe they these die? kids can live? How about that? <laughs> well, that's um, what they had said too in the interview. They were like, why? Why do they need to die? Their children? This, yeah, the, it, I feel like it's a cultural obsession with pop culture now. It's like we gotta make our sacrifices. But um, I think this was an interesting discussion. I, I mm-hmm. maybe if I had to do it again, I would have done it not right up against Andor because I feel like we did focus too much on Andor, which is. I really wanted to talk about things be besides Andor because Andor is the one that is going to be oh, more serious. But really quick to answer the question of how they could solve it is stop doing prequels that butt up against something where everybody dies. Yeah, yeah, like knowing stop, people's fates and stuff. Stop like, going up to a point where you're like, well, all these people can't exist, so therefore the only way to not have them exist is to kill them. Yeah, like the I, the end of Andor <laughs> could be him and K two riding off in into hyperspace, and you're like. Dude, in one week, you're getting hit by a nuclear weapon on a beach. Right. And that's depressing. <laughs> that's not hopeful. That's depressing. I know, I know, I know. When, I'm not trying to round it back out. I just think that's, that's it's it, funny that that's probably going to happen. It is It is interesting, though, like I, that we've always kind of leaned on that, that the, the characters, uh, they weren't around, so you have to kill them. And I'm always like, but there's I, there's plenty of examples of characters that were around and they clearly went and i think like the biggest one to me is just like hera hera was never not involved she didn't go away to take care no, of her kid or anything but like they that gotta, they gotta carefully weave her in and that's another discussion to have but but i, but I don't think they really do because the original movies very much focused on these three characters like we mm-hmm. barely saw mm-hmm. any of like mon mothma and the whole re- re- resistant like rebellion sure. and all that it was so sure. focused that i feel like it's very easy to be like oh yeah well you know cal kestis was just over here doing but this mission or something you know maybe that one's kind of weird because he's a force user but maybe just stop creating new jedi before the original trilogy i think we're good but like I, I said think before, we just need to George's go off fault. <laughs> yeah, I think we just need to go off and tell new stories yeah. like like yeah. James said either completely separate of the empire or what's mm-hmm. going like, on stop, or beyond what we know. Stop making us fans have to explain like why Leia didn't react better to Obi-Wan's death and stuff. Like we don't put don't make us have to do that. Go tell but other stories. I think stories. that's what's fun. I I Oh god. I don't Kick, oh. I don't like it necessarily. Oh, I would god think it almighty. would be great if we just like had that, but cuz then people I think, part- oh that's why she said Ben Kenobi. It's like oh, I know. Everyone knows. <laughs> Everyone knows that. You're not a genius. But what? 
I just th- I think it's fun sometimes where Not you're you like, oh, that doesn't really make sense. Yeah. What's a fun way to try to like headcanon that to be like, how could it make sense? You know, I sometimes John's I think that's talking fun. about the the tweets online and stuff that are like, this is clearly why they said this line. Oh, it's just like, like yes, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> I feel like it's it's honestly when I see that I always want to reply with that gif of Lieutenant Dan <laughs> when Forrest goes Lieutenant Dan you don't have any legs and he goes I know that Forrest <laughs> <Just like, laughs> we all know you're not a, you're not as smart as you think we all get it we all get it all right mm. here we go um, let's I'm hopeful that this discussion is ending. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hand it over to Lacey for uh, the next segment. All right, guys, it's time for resistance transmissions. <laughs> so this is the part of the show where John puts up a crazy, wacky situation on Twitter, and you guys give your answers. So this week, he said, General Huck survived being shot by Pride and now runs the drive through at a Ronto Roasters. John is really hung up on the Ronto rap. Uh, Poe Dameron finds this out and decides to go. Hux, welcome to Ronto Roasters. How can I help you? What are some things Poe would say to mess with Hux? John, you really want a Ronto rap right now? I, I would eat 12 in an hour. <laughs> First up is Blog of the Hut. At Blaga the Hut. What up, Blaga? Where you been? <laughs> he said, They fry now? <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Mike Ramori at Drum Jedi. What up, Mike? He said, Poe, yes. Hello, hugs. I'd like to place an order for your mom. Oh. Next is Stephen A. Bowman <laughs> at Stephen A. Bowman. What up, Stephen? He said, Poe, hi. I have several orders in my speeder. Hux, fine. What is the first order? Poe, I figured you'd already know the answer to that, Hugs. Laughs and speeds away. Hux, sc- screams intelligibly into calm. <laughs> Mike Lovins at Mike Lovins That is took up. me a minute, actually. I was like, I don't get it. Because <laughs> <Yeah, but, laughs> what's, what's the first order? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, Mike. Mike said, t- Poe to Hux, well, now that all your friends are dead, things have been a bit slow for me. So, are you guys hiring? I could fry anything. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> Next is Julian Krautinski. You know what I? You Krautinsky. know what I love about? I know we're coming up on like six hours on this episode, but <laughs> I I love that Lacey does like will not make fun of the audience for the bad jokes. I love that she, even though she might want to, she won't go there. And I love it. <laughs> Julian said at the drive through window, quote, so who talks first? I talk first or you talk first? Nice. That's Makes clever. Yeah. It's clever. One of my favorite parts from Force Awakens. Next is Saw Dust Pixel at Saw Dust Pixel. What up? They said, somehow, <laughs> pumpkin <laughs> spice returned. <laughs> I can't I'm already wait. seeing people talk about it. They're already I getting their pumpkin. Wait. Th- I disgusting. love them. So disgusting. I don't know why I'm whispering. I'm just very excited. I'm you hopeful like, you that like pumpkin, pumpkin spice is returned. Of course. Do I'm they a have basic spice white girl. Crepes? It's in my blood. What? Yeah. Do they have pumpkin spice crepes? I'm sure they do. I need to find a crepe place. Jeez Back please. to you, John. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening and watching and being a part of TRB. Uh, before I get to the normal outro, I just want to say thank you to our patrons of TRB at patreon.com slash resistance broadcast. James talked about it at the top. If you're a tier two and above, you can submit topics to the show. Get on the show. I mean, look at Stephen A. Bowman. Two appearances on the episode. Great job, Stephen. Uh, but um, all joking aside, tiers $2 a month. It really helps us a great deal. And uh, we have... Uh, our next phase of Patreon coming up in the future and more details on that. But uh, it's all thanks to you, really. So uh, we're very excited for what's to come. Uh, but sign up because we have Andor coming up soon and we have a great rest of the year planned here at TRB. But I want to say a special thank you to our generals and spice runners on Patreon. Our generals, starting with the longest running patron, maybe our longest patron ever. Uh mm. 
miss you dearly, Carmelo. And we have John Reese, Jetta Rosewater, Paul Olson, Frank Grande, Darth Hurricane, John Charlton, Nick Kratz, Christian Morales, Brian Smith, Matt Chitty, Danny, Mike Ramori, Matt Heath, Chris White, Brendan McLaughlin, Count Pepto, Samuel Zilke, and Val Trichkoff. Thanks, Generals. And Spice Runners, David Probus, Neil Shaw, Kendall Gellner, Ryan Wara, Dave Hornack, Micah Harrison, Thomas Hennessy, Andrew Staley, and Jeremy Myers. Thank you all so much for your support and all of our patrons. Uh, it means a great deal. Um, make sure you go to Star Wars News Net for all of your Star Wars news, reviews, editorials, information, and more. If you're watching on YouTube, scroll down below. There's links to our merch if you want to pick up some of our merch over at Spring. Uh, quick and easy way to do that. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Johnny Hoey, writing and editing at StarWarsNewsNet.com. And my movie podcast, Just Like the Movies, just put out an episode on Dirty Harry on Tuesday. Spoiler alert, Dirty Harry doesn't die in Dirty Harry. Uh, Lacey, how about you? That is a spoiler. Uh, people could find me on Twitter and Instagram at Lacey Gillerin. Movie came out like 52 years ago. Doesn't matter. Uh, still a spoiler. John James. dropped more. John dropped two spoilers tonight. <laughs> um, two? Oh, yeah. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Meyer Trunks. What was the other one? You spoiled Stranger Things. That's the third time you've spoiled Stranger Things. I did Things. not spoil Stranger Things. You literally what told me something about the show that I did not know today. What did I tell you? I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> you are you are you are getting crazy with this stuff, dude. All right, crazy. Yes, you're getting crazy. You Absolutely are literally incre- telling how the show ends on our show. That I'm, are you talking I'm about so what I said about season three of the show that came out three freaking years ago? Get out of here. Go watch the show. Jeez, Louise. Have a good weekend. Go watch the show, James. I'll talk to you Monday. Everyone, have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time right here on TRB. See you around, kids.